In his New Year's speech, China's President Xi admitted that the country has challenges, both with jobs and for businesses. And we have seen a slowing down of China's amazing growth over the past year. So what's in store for 2024? We're going to get an inside story now from a speaker who has just, he has just published a book that has received lots of praise, the new China playbook. She's born in China, she's educated in the United States, and she's now professor at the London School of Economics. And she is going to challenge some of the myths and common wisdoms about China. So please give a very warm welcome to K.U. Jin. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. It's an enormous privilege to be here with you uh, in Oslo, uh, a place I've visited now my third time. Um, I'm very happy to share with you some perspectives about China. And as Syria has mentioned, potentially look at an inside perspective, take an alternative lens, because this is a behemoth of an economy, second largest in the world. You know, there's some debate about when, when or whether it will be the first uh, largest economy in the world, but also an economy and a country that is very hard to read, very hard to understand. So to understand what's actually happening, I, I bid you to look at what's actually happening on the ground. Separate that from the rhetoric, often very loud, uh, not solely rely on, on the Western press, press. And here with you, I'd like to use a telescope, uh, a microscope, and a scalpel to decipher uh, China from the inside. So first of all, uh, with the context that, the context that you have brought, let me first of all say that uh, in the immediate future, the dismal situation and outlook of the Chinese economy is very real. But it's primarily a demand deficit, a problem of demand. And that is fueled by the triple whammy of the scarring effects of the pandemic. Let's not, remember, let's not forget that the Chinese households, unlike the Americans and the Europeans, never got um, a, a, a support from the government during the pandemic. Uh, and uh, coupled with uh, you know, the kind of declining real estate sector, and uh, regulatory controls, tighter re regular controls that have really hampered investor confidence that has led to a sharp decline in confidence, pretty much the lowest in the last 40 years of China's amazing uh, growth uh, trajectory. And uh, whether it's consumers, investors, or companies, the primordial sentiment today is, let's wait and see. And I think that's also causing a lot of the slowdown. But I'll, I'll talk about the real challenges uh, 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 I perceive, as opposed to the, the myths uh, later on in, in my speech. At the same time, something else very real is also happening. And I don't really think that gets uh, enough attention around the world and not really enough understanding. So for the first time in, in history, really, China as a developing country is making cutting edge technology. I'll have some comments about you know, how, it, how, how our views uh, potentially connect or d d uh, uh, differ from the previous views, but a very important uh, think tank have published a survey, sorry, a result, a report uh, last year that out of the 44 cutting edge technology research, China's leading in 35 of them. Uh, Chris has mentioned Huawei's breakthrough. Uh, not, not long after the restrictions coming from Biden's export controls, China's domestic capacity is able to overcome these restrictions, at least for now. We can quibble about the quality and the reality and all that, but this is not a small issue. It's caused such a national euphoria, saying that it's not only despite of uh, these Biden controls, but potentially because of these controls, that you're getting this national mobilization to tackle critical technology, that you have created this unlikely alliances of big techs and whole the nation systems to go after these so-called strategic vulnerabilities. The Chinese were ho so happy about these, um, the breakthrough and uh, because of these controls that the people are saying, pleading the US government, can you also please sanction our national men's football team too? 
So that is, that is a different kind of sentiment and a different kind of reaction you're getting from China. So I want to try to bring in a different perspective here. Interestingly enough, despite what is happening between US and China, and I'll come back to that later, it is highly ironic, I think, that today, four out of the five most downloaded apps in the US are Chinese. Not only TikTok, Shein, the fashion brand, um, Timu, owned by Pinduoduo, one other. But that global exodus of Chinese companies, I think, is a wave that we should be watching. Because don't forget, 90% of the people in today's world still live in developing countries. And they have a very different view, different perspective on China than the more hawkish military kind of view that we have heard in the West and so forth. They have a very different view because Chinese technologies are eminently practical, cheaper, with same amount of quality or higher quality, and they are intended to solve developing countries' issues. And so that exodus of Chinese companies going global is something that we should also watch. So I guess when we talk about the problems and the challenges, which are real, very real today, I mean, it's, you know, it's a total uh, 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 lie flat kind of phenomenon in China today, we got to ask the question, is this really cyclical? or structural, some permanent decline a la West uh, depiction of demographics, of state controls, this lost engine for growth. We, we want to ask that question because booms and busts are a natural feature of market economies, which happen to be that China never experienced the bus cycle. And I don't think it's healthy. In the last 40 years, China has always tried to avoid a recession and smooth out wherever there was the, the GDP and inflation numbers, because uh, it cannot tolerate uh, cyclicality and volatility. And the consequence of that is that there's no proper exit mechanisms to weed out the bad and less productive firms. So they all st stayed around until now. Now, the real, the real estate sector, the cleansing out of the system, the weeding out of all the least productive firms are all happening. That's the only positive side I see of having a bus cycle, but China never had it. And so companies never exited, no matter, and they were sucking up resources where it should have gone to new uh, entrepreneurship and better firms. But that bus cycle is a natural feature. Um, and it's also surprising that for an economy of that size, an economy that has grown at that speed, has never really had one fundamental financial collapse in the last 40 years. I think financial system is relatively stable right now. We can come back to the debt issues in the Q&A. But um, that has also meant that these you know, boom-bust cycles is probably going to be a new feature, and more volatility, new feature of the Chinese economy. Now, I mentioned that technology and innovation is so important because it fundamentally is the only way for a country to get out of the middle-income trap. Only 13 countries in the last 60 years or so um, have uh, was able to overcome the middle income trap. And now everybody's talking about China falling into middle income trap. But all of these countries, including the likes of Brazil and Thailand and all those, actually was much richer than China before. It was a productivity loss. It was the inability to have domestic innovation capability to keep productivity levels up, productivity growth up. So switching from capital investment to productivity-driven investment, uh, driven growth is China challenge, and that only comes from innovation. So in my view, this is way more important than two quarters or three quarters of bad GDP. The ability to innovate the ability to have some kind of domestic reliance, even though those have geopolitical consequences, is fundamentally more important, even than the real estate. But let me try to, let me try to also say that because the real estate is so large, right, 30% of GDP broadly accounted for, even if China has a now a green re revolution, a renewables revolution, all these high-tech, cutting-edge technologies going on, it is not possible to replace and displace real estate as a driving force of growth and employment, and that is the problem. The renewable sector has seen you know, a lot of success, and I think this is really one bright spot in, in the Chinese economy, um, but again, and, and lots of the model, and the unique model that China has, has pushed and fostered uh, to make these accomplishments, which I'll, I'll talk about next, um, is now introduced to the renewable sector. But, you know, is it going to be trillions of dollars in investment uh, 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 going forward? That's a, that's a question. So that is the problem of replacing real estate. So in this respect, 
in terms of a macro perspective, a different perspective, I want to bring two, three things. And the first is really principally coming back to first principles in economics. A few statistics I think will be telling. There are still about 900 million people in China who live under $300 per month. That is not middle income even by international standards. Okay? There are 176 million migrant workers who, if they had the proper social protection and equivalent uh, rights of the urban worker, can unleash at least an additional one trillion RMB of consumption every year, at the very least. And um, when economies like South Korea and Taiwan and uh, Japan stagnated or their growth leveled off, as a share of GDP, sorry, as a share of US productivity levels, they were about 80 to 85% already. China today's productivity or, um, per, or labor productivity level is only 20% of US levels, okay? Tertiary education, a measure of human capital in the skilled labor force, is 80% of the labor force in the US, and in China it is 58%. The service sector, 47% of employment in China as opposed to 80% in the likes of US and Japan, and only 52% of GDP. All of this, I can go on and on, but these are just, just to tell you the gap. Okay, the gap between where China is today and where China should be, given the fundamental factors of education, skill, labor, saving, capital, et cetera, of where it should be just by the pure, sheer force of convergence. And that's what I mean by economic principles. We do see convergence in the data. If we look at the last 80 years of growth and uh, trajectory, we do see economic convergence conditional on a few things, the things that I mentioned, things like education and saving. So with that fundamental factors in China, China should have a good couple of decades to go if the right reforms are, uh, are adopted. And of course, that is a big if, and that's potentially not an economic issue, it's potentially a political issue. The second is that China is an incredibly distorted economy the, the, the kind of paradox or the contradiction is on the one hand, China is the second largest world economy, wields great influence on the world and wants to be a great stakeholder and wants to have great global influence, but it practically is a developing country on many levels. One big major distortion is still in the financial system. 80% uh, of the social aggregate credit is intermediated by the banking system. That is one very common feature of a developing country uh, market, uh, uh, developing uh, market. Uh, in the U.S., 80% of uh, credit is, comes from direct capital markets, right? Only 15% of that is in China. Now, I mention that as being fundamentally important because somehow we have the view, as we read Western press, that the state suppresses the private, the state wants to extort the private. I want to bust that myth uh, a little bit later, but I will agree that there is an implicit discrimination that is very important towards the private sector, and that is channeled from the financial system. So when monetary policy or credit is channeled through that, that financial, uh, sorry, that, that system, there are layers and layers and layers of financial intermediaries, the top layer being 50-some institutions, and the second layer being 2,000-something financial institutions, and each of them has a white list of who can they lend to and who they can't lend to. So that means the real economy, the real private sector, by the way, which is the driving force of the economy because they account for 80% of GDP, 80% of employment, and 80% of innovation, they don't have access to that kind of capital. It's always channeled to state firms or very connected, politically connected uh, private companies. And so that institutional flaw is the reason why there's a lot of crowding out of pri private sector. There's, you know, the private entrepreneurs feel that there's a big challenge and difficulty, and especially in bad times, they are the ones that suffer. But it's that institutional flaw that has created that implicit discrimination that is very hard to fix in the short run for a variety uh, of reasons. Another distortion, migration. There's very little provincial, interprovincial migration. Less than 5% of the population can migrate to other places. Now, if you're a worker who lost your job in Massachusetts and Boston, you can move to Texas and Florida if you find another job. That's not the case in China. Even compared to India, 
inter interprovincial migration is extremely low, and it's prohibitively costly because of the social urban uh, protection, lack of urban protection, also the hukou system that prevents the mi migration. So calculations have found that if we were able to double that flow of people across regions, you're also able to increase productivity by at least 30%, and these are significant numbers. I want to mention that because if we just take a few provinces on the eastern coast, or just take the entire eastern coast of China, it's already a rich economy. Many of them have reached South Korea's standards of living. What does that tell you? It, tell you, it tells you that China can do it. China can be a middle-high income economy. But what's dragging it is the central western provinces that hasn't really found um, its source of economic well-being. But all technologies and employment and skill, labor and education, all of that, and I'll come back to a very interesting anecdote, which I think is very telling, that can already be done and accomplished uh, in China. So this anecdote I told you, uh, I'm going to tell you, is um, a dinner I had last week uh, in China with a party uh, um, secretary from uh, a very interesting city in the province of Jiangsu. Um, it's not a big city in Chinese standards, but it is the size of Singapore. Um, uh, and it has, um, it, it, they're very modest, they said, you know, maybe you can write about my story, but there's so many of them, that's the whole point. They, they have reached 35,000 of per capita GDP. Okay? The party, um, uh, uh, um, the provincial uh, party secretary, sorry, the city par party secretary, a woman, is supercharged. They have something like 500 German uh, multinationals there. She said that once there was an intellectual property threat and she gathered, garnered the judiciary and everybody around for a midnight conference and just was able to handle the situation and, 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 and uh, resolve it, no IP uh, leakage whatsoever. She said, you know, we want to open it up to all the foreign companies, all the private companies. She's talking to entrepreneurs everywhere, trying to bring them into, their, into her city, very successfully. She's also trained tens of thousands of students, graduated from vocational training, retrained them so they can be the appropriate labor force for the factories uh, that are in her city. And these, these students from poor families suddenly got 7,000 RMB you know, right after graduation per month, and they were, they were just absolutely um, thrilled. That reminds me that governments can really do a lot, you know, retraining and retooling. And the lack of that in the U.S. was one of the reasons why the China shock was felt uh, so, so strongly. My understanding of this part of the world is that there is significant effort. But I want to bring that, um, uh, this, this anecdote because it's what I describe in, the, uh, in, the, in my book as the mayor economy. Okay, it's, it's funnier in Chinese because jingji, the mayor economy, is very similar to jingji, which means market economy. That's why we, we make the joke. It's not as funny, but I think the mayor economy is a good enough captive uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, title because China is not just a centralized system. That's what we all think. It's politically centralized, but it's radically economically decentralized. And that lies in, in there lies the fundamental success story of China's economy. It's all these mayors running around, the, the, the lady that I mentioned, um, since the 1980s. They're entrepreneurial. They're often risk takers. They want to bring in the best technologies and investments and capital, and they help the private entrepreneurs. Why do they help the private entrepreneurs? Because they are the best. They want to help the best, not the worst or the most politically connected, because by helping the good entrepreneurs, you're creating an entire ecosystem of success. They bring jobs. They bring fiscal revenue. And by the way, this, this city, more than half of the fiscal revenues comes from taxes, okay? not from real estate. They have very low GDP, uh, debt to GDP ratio. So again, uh, I'll come back to, to, to what we should take out from this story. They want to help these private entrepreneurs because then they create the retail sector. Then even the real estate that they own is worth more. They are building mini Silicon Valleys all around China. And it's only useful if you help the good ones, the productive ones. And so they do that. They don't just help one or two, they help thousands. And so if you look at a picture of the distribution of unicorns, unicorn companies in China, they're spread all over. 
with exception of the western, certain central province, but really not just in Beijing, Shenzhen, Shanghai, and Shenzhen, as you all know. Even in a, a second, -tier, second tier cities, whether it's Wuxi, Wuhan, Suzhou, Hefei, many places you've not heard of, there are global quantum avenues running through, global companies. Uh, there are 300 EV cars all in China, and they're all backed by some local provincial party secretary, and they compete. So they're spread all over, and I think that decentralized uh, nature, what I call the mayor economy, is really important to understand, not only to explain China's past growth, also to realize today's challenges, but also to look forward in the future. Why? Because it's the same model, same platform they're using to develop renewables, undertake the green transition, and all of that. It's the same model because the central government needs the local governments to implement. And what do the local mayors get out of this? Why do they want to do the best thing for the economy? Obviously, they're not elected. They don't face re-election pressure because they have political ambitions to rise up the ranks. Uh, the ones that deliver the best economic results Coupled with a bunch of other things now, it's not as simple as GDP. In the past, it was just GDP. And that's why everyone was uh, what we call GDP worshipping those days. And that's how you climbed up the ranks, because then you can become the provincial city uh, party secretary and then provincial party secretary. You become uh, at the very top rank of the central government. Actually, President Xi's father was one of those successful political leaders that um, implemented reforms, made an economic success, and went stri straight to the top ranks of uh, the leadership. And they're all competing with each other. So if you think about corruption and the lack of democratic, democratic mechanisms, there are much more nuanced mechanisms of competition and checks and balances in China that we may not see from the outside. And so these cadres rotate three to five years. They compete with each other, right? Um, and there's a lot of monitoring systems involved from the central top down. It's a, it's a convoluted apparatus, but it's certainly not just a one-man show. That would be a very, very naive understanding reading of what's actually going on uh, in China. And certainly for the economy, it is, um, it is uh, absolutely uh, critical. Um, so the mayor model. Now, let me tell you one, an another example. Solar panels, right? Look, China led the solar panel boom in the world, and that really happened after the mid-2000s. And um, something that happened then was that uh, the Chinese governments encouraged the local governments to implement a series of supportive measures for, for the solar industries. I want to caveat the support by critically emphasizing that it's not just financial subsidies. There are now far and few between, because first of all, the local governments are pretty much um, um, uh, bankrupt, right? Because of three years of PCR testing that cost, you know, four trillion RMB. Um, so they don't have that financial muscle. It's not just the financial subsidy. It's everything else. It's attracting talent. You know, this uh, provincial party secretary told me that she subsidizes 10% of the down payment of real estate, your first purchase of house if you're a talented uh, worker. Um, it is, coming back to what I was saying about the implicit discrimination in the financial system, helping them coordinate with local banks, local state banks, helping them coordinate financing. Uh, it is um, other kinds of um, overcoming business barriers, which for any developing country uh, amounts to insurmountable barriers if you don't have their support. So it's not just the financial subsidy. But the solar panel was very interesting because um, ever since the 2005 government in, uh, uh, introduction of these government policies, support policies were introduced, they were implemented in different cities at different periods of time, different times and uh, different geographical spaces and times. And I don't have this picture with me, but it is a phenomenal, uh, uh, remarkable uh, 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 you know, scene. Between 2005 and 2017, you saw the solar patents, internationally uh, recognized patents, first of all, just completely exploding, and exactly in the way that is proportionate to the policies, support policies that were introduced at the city levels. So 
before we want to hesitate about what state can do or should not do, and I, you know, I, I also have my own ambiguous feelings about that, it's important to recognize that that model has worked in many areas and in many aspects in China, and that's the mayor model, but coupled with, with that, that, um, that central direction. And it's the same thing now with renewables. Again, the same model. Robotics, okay, same thing. Demographics, we talk about demographics as one of the potentially um, leading uh, causes of or potential threats to the Chinese economy. Well, first of all, China exports 50% of the world's uh, rob robots. If there was a policy in place to encourage factories to adopt robots, it would just be spread out very, very quickly, and that would lead to automation. Very interesting uh, recent broader study academically, a uh, very important study, showed that after 1990, the more aging countries are actually richer, not poorer, they're richer. That was not the case before 1990, if you take the sample of these countries, they were poor. And the reason is 1990 being so important because that's the arrival of automotive technologies. And these countries tended to adopt more robots and automotive technologies, and that tended to expand output in lots of various aspects. I'm not going to deliberate on this issue, but just trying to emphasize that huge mayor economy model can be very imp uh, important in enacting systemic-wide changes very shortly. That's what happened to the EVs. Within 10 years, China became the largest producer and consumers of EVs, and it does help that the government can roll out 4 million EV charging stations around the country, as opposed to 160,000 in the US. It critically does make that kind of difference. But now the real challenges, okay? First of all, that political economy model that I told you about, which was so forceful and important for China's growth, especially in a very short period of time, is under serious challenge. Is it suitable for the new era? My book is called The New China Playbook, right? For the new era, it's something else. It's not manufacturing, it's not investment, it's not just making stuff. It's critical technologies, innovation, that result, that requires openness, creativity, entrepreneurial, IP, all of that, right? Is that suitable for that? Well, currently, there's a very real threat, which is the debt overhang. That mayor economy, which was so effective, the double-edged sword is that when it's so vulnerable right now because of the debt burdens many of these um, uh, local governments face, that can introduce some very distorted behavior on the government level. Maybe not, not to the extent of extorting private sector, but you know, choosing to um, put its own agenda of resolving debt ahead of the growth and others, crowding out private sector, uh, and not really having enough financial muscle to implement a lot of these strategic uh, goals. The second real challenge is a political economy behavioral challenge. It's that lack of incentive and lack of enthusiasm. And why is that? Well, you know, there was a huge anti-corruption drive in the last uh, 10 years or so. Look, that was very important socially. The grassroots of China, we hear a lot about what the elites about China are saying, complaining about. We don't necessarily hear a lot about what the grassroots are, 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 are saying. You know, they love that anti-corruption campaign. They love these regulatory crackdowns, right? Uh, education system. I understand the enormous capital markets financial consequences. Not a good thing for the Chinese economy, not a good thing for the Chinese um, financial system. But that was the single biggest source of angst for Chinese families. The overcrowded, competitive education system where, you know, ordinary families had to spend uh, more than a quarter of their annual income on educating one child. These are some of the real social issues that China is going to have to grapple with in the coming years that's going to be not necessarily but potentially inimical to growth. And so the government, lots of these mayors, a lot of these party secretaries are the ones that I described, those in Shenzhen and southern China, but many of them are saying, look, it's no longer the economy that matters just the economy that matters. It's other things like political loyalty, like social stability. For a few years ago, it was the pandemic. So the metric on assessing these mayors have changed. And so their focus have changed. And many of them come to the conclusion, rather than do nothing, rather than do something and take the risk, right? It's exactly the opposite of the late 1970s and 80s, where 
by spearing ahead and taking risk, you had potentially the chance of being the paragon of success and everybody following you. Now, very few people want to take these kind of risks. It's not politically um, a, a, a good, safe bet. Um, I think that's underlying the problem. Apart from the short-term confidence issues, if you have that local government sentiment that now is the time to do things to push forward the economy and everybody has to get their act together, I think the situation would be very changed. And very briefly, a skill mi mismatch for the youth, high youth unemployment, 25%. Um, a lot of these people have really, you know, they've emptied their bank accounts, the parents, to educate these kids, and they found themselves without jobs. That poses a social problem. So let me conclude to say that, look, there are seemingly irreconcilable, <laughs> irreconcilable paradox to the Western eye might not be so in, Ch in the Chinese, in the, to the Chinese people. I would suspend our biases, okay? We tend to use our own framework and lens and perspective, especially a cultural and social perspective, to judge others. I think that would be a mistake because there's a lot of people in China thinking potentially differently about their government and their economy. I think it's important to do one's homework in China. Let me tell you that even if China grows 3% and India grows at 7% until 2030, in the year 2030, China will still be contributing $17 trillion more to global GDP than India. And over the next few years until 2030, China is still going to contribute $128 additional trillion uh, USD to the world um, uh, than India is. So the size is there. So you just can't just simply, you know, kind of say China is uninvestable. China is thrust aside. But doing one's homework, identifying these opportunities, and really make serious and rigorous risk return analysis. Of course, sometimes it's hard. We just talked about Taiwan. These are these are really uh, very important. Um, for uh, an economy which uh, has the engineers, the talents, the money, uh, and all of that to potentially still succeed. But in any case, let me conclude that by saying that the new generation, those born after the 1980s, 1990s, they pre present a really great in international bridge. Their outlook is very, very different. They have a very more socially conscious, um, and um, they have a view to see more peace uh, in China and the region uh, than otherwise. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'd like you to uh, take a seat over here. And uh, thank you for sending in questions. If you have questions to Kiyu, you can send them in on the online platform. And we have already a few for you here. But I'd like to, to pick up on uh, something uh, that you closed on, uh, Kiyu Jin. You talked about the youth. And in your book, you tell us that this is a different generation in many ways. And the lack of ability to exploit their knowledge and skills is a key problem. To what extent can that also be a problem for stability in China? First of all, I would say do watch out for the new generation. They're radically different from my parents' generation who went through the Cultural Revolution, some went through the Great Famine. They've seen huge vicissitudes. They're very risk averse. They're high savers. Um, and they're very, very, very hardworking, that generation. I think that was a big part of the global problem when you had, got a billion more people in the labor force in the world, all taking three shifts per night. Um, that causes a global challenge. That's not the new generation. They like to travel. They like to. They spend twice as much as you know. People born after 1980s spent twice as much, uh, even compared to those born in 1970s, on things like apparel and and food and entertainment. Mm. So, with a bit of prosperity, and that's the maturity of a country and an economy over time, is a more relaxed, less ambitious, less hardworking. Um, more socially conscious. Why? Because they can afford to. It's no longer just about 
sustaining one's uh, you know, basic needs. It's about, if you look at the surveys of this, this new generation, they care about animal rights, they care, care about the environment, they care about social equity, they like diversity, they care about you know, minority rights, things that previous generations never debated about. So I think it's the coming age of China with that new generation that is a potential you know, source of hope. Mm. But the challenge, as you mentioned now, is that many of them are not gonna, finding jobs. There's 100 million more additional college graduates in the last 10 years because um, the premier from many years ago decided to expand a, a secondary education. Um, the first thing is, I think it's primarily still, oh, there are two things. One is, is an economic situation right now, bad economy. The second is that, um, look, there are a lot of jobs in China waiting to be filled, but they're in manufacturing. And China wants to be the smart manufacturer of the world, right? A larger, smarter Germany, if you will, based on uh, powered by AI and communications. And, and that's interesting. You mentioned Germany, not the U.S. Not the U.S. I think there's actually very overlap, a very little overlap with the financialized knowledge economy of the U.S., service-oriented. China wants, Chinese government uh, officials want China to be um, a manufacturing, a producer of stuff in its mind that is real, mm. not property, not finance and all that. I'm not saying I agree with that view at all, but um, Germany is a paragon of success. Mm. And so that's where the jobs are. There are 25 million missing jobs or uh, jobs to be ready to be filled in the next three years in manufacturing. But these kids, they graduate from college. They don't want to take up these jobs. That's the mismatch. And, and is that a potential source of instability in China? Look, the government watches it very closely. But I say that because of there are many challenges in China today, that's not the first order one. The first order one is real estate because that concerns every single family in China. Mm. If, if, if they really let the real estate go or the prices drop, then look, that's going to be the real threat to social stability. But they're not going to do that. Mm. So. And I, I have to also congratulate you on your book because it has been named by Forbes as uh, one of the 10 sort of must-reads for board members. And uh, in the book, you, you've spent quite a lot of time busting myths. What do you see as the most harmful myth mm. about China for investors? Uh, it's hard to say what's the most harmful. I think it's all pretty bad. Um, just mis mistrust leads, uh, feeds on to misunderstanding, feeds on mistrust. Um, but I'd start with the Chinese people. As much as I'm an economist, I realize that a lot of this is social, social and cultural differences. Uh, there's a presumption that somehow everybody in Chinese is utterly miserable. It's something that I just I find very hard to to, you know, I find it very ironic given how bad the situation is pretty much everywhere else. But the Chinese people don't think about, think the same things. There's a huge difference, a huge difference in preferences at the cultural level, you can see by international surveys. So um, the Chinese people expects their government to do a lot. Uh, some might see that as totally intolerable what the Chinese state is doing, but they actually expect that. In return, they give some deference, but not blind submission, because they do revolt. Um, and I think another thing to, to, to understand for investors is that Chinese policies or sentiment, or, or sorry, government preferences do shift much more than you think. I always joke that um, in the US, parties change, but policies don't. Uh, in China, it's the opposite. And um, you can see pendulum swings. Mm. If they think that they've really made a mistake, they will, they will radically change. That, that, now, there might be a time lag before they actually realize that or finally submit to it, but they can change from left to right, from one far end to the other. And I think that's the spirit with which we should you know, think about China. To, a few months ago, or say um, before the 20th Party Congress, it was a lot of confidence. It was a lot about ideology. It was a lot about security. Today, it's now the economy is back. It's now about the economy. Mm. And let's, bring in some, uh, let's bring in some questions from the audience here. And uh, one in the audience is asking, what is the Chinese entrepreneur's view on the Nordic countries? Will the investment increase or decrease in the future? Certainly there's a view that the entrepreneurial environment is very, very lively here. 
And I, from my understanding, a lot of investors are actively looking uh, at uh, investments here and their potential collaborations. Um, so I think it's, 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 it's a model of inspiration for a lot of these Chinese entrepreneurs. But I, I would just say that as much as I've told you that we should watch for the exodus of Chinese companies going global, it is very difficult. It's still very challenging. First of all, you have to face the most cutthroat competition domestically, uh, which is why once you survive that round and become a winner there, you're pretty much the most competitive product uh, internationally. That's very, very possible for a lot of the, the products now today. But after that, you just don't have that kind of muscle and strength and resources to devote, and there's so many barriers uh, outside. So right now, we're only seeing the very big ones having that kind of success. Um, but you know, it's, it would be very unfortunate to, to cut that link between the Nordic and uh, Chinese uh, 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 technological exchange. Mm. And then we have uh, another question going to your uh, mention of the debt problem. In what way can China solve that problem? The debt issue has real political economy complexities behind it. Uh, you know, I always thought, okay, who cares about moral hazard at a, at a point in time when you know the Chinese economy is going to collapse? You guys just go and save these, these, uh, these, these local governments. And that dinner I mentioned, she said, look, you know, this is very real. Everybody's talking about we behave so well. Okay, we didn't borrow. We would be respons uh, We were responsible. If we knew that we should be crazily borrowing like them, then everybody should be doing that. So that sentiment is something that the central government is facing every day. It's very real that they want to prevent moral hazard. They don't really want to put the burden on the central government unless they really have to. They believe that you know the, the local governments should resolve their own problem to the extent they can, and it's a lot of that political. A debate and fighting that's preventing them from coming up with a very uh, consistent policy. But let's just let me just say it's a bottom line approach. Unless there's a real collapse, they're not going to do much, and they want to leave it to the local governments to resolve themselves, except for the rare cases when they need to step in. And we're getting lots and lots of questions for you uh, here, Professor. So uh, one line response. One line <laughs> response would be fantastic. Yes. It could be difficult, though. In your brilliant book, one says you describe a large shadow economy in China. How is that reconciled with the Communist Party wanting control? Another very interesting... <laughs> uh, control is absolutely right, and they have to face between control and opening up. But shadow is a testing ground for liberalization. So that's why they're interested in allowing for that. As, as, as good as I can in one sentence to answer your Fantastic. question. Fantastic. <laughs> what do you think about the future of Hong Kong? I'm, f I'm actually um, caref cautiously optimistic. I think it's, you know, it's trying to reposition itself as a financial c center for digital currency and others. Maybe a lot of the foreigners have left, but now there are others, South, Southeast, uh, South Indians coming in, Middle Easterns coming in, replacing the new, um, the new generations. Uh, look, let me just say that it makes China look good if, China, if Hong Kong is successful, not the other way around. So it's in every bit of interest to position China, uh, Hong Kong as a financial conduit for global capital flows going in and out of China. Mm. And then you mentioned anti-corruption campaigns, and uh, there has been a, a crackdown also on Western consultancy firms there. What does that mean to China if the foreign companies leave or the investors leave? Let me, let me answer this in three sentences because it is very, very important. First of all, there are many departments in China. They don't have one view. You have the propaganda department, you have the security department, you have the economics and finance department, and they all have their own interests. Do the economics and finance want to see this? Absolutely not. They have to clean up the mess. They are the ones that push for openness and welcoming foreign capital. And you've seen this very dramatic turn in, uh, in sentiment towards foreign capital, trying to lure them back in. Now, of course, the Chinese government is not good at understanding what it means to sustain confidence and expectations, right? It hasn't had the experience that you guys have had here. But the security department simply does its own thing, and it clashes. And un unless there's a major clash, the top level is not going to come and resolve these things. So I wouldn't read that message as China being uh, unfriendly towards foreign, actually quite the opposite, but it's in conflict with a lot of these technocratic errors that we're seeing across the board. Mm. And 
in one sentence, what, what question do you think will define China for investors this year? <sighs> um, watch for a slow rebound in confidence and, you know, potential restoration of normalcy, but a slow and gradual one. Thank you so much for coming. Kei Jin. Thank you. Thank you.